to come to the to the stage, um, starting with ladies first, uh, Emma Gordon, who's the uh, who's the analyst of the energy on energy investment for the International Energy Agency, and uh, please come to the podium to the stage, <clears throat> and uh, she's going to help us with providing some uh, kind of a, a framing um, sort of presentation on the ensuing discussion. Um, we have uh, uh, just to announce, I know he's going to be late, but just to let you know, Gareth Philip, uh, manager of the Climate and, uh, and Environment Finance Division at the FED, is wrapping up uh, uh, an intervention, but he's going to join us soon. Um, then we have, um, and I hope I'm not mispronouncing the name, Miatichi Omambia, uh, Deputy Director for Progress and Partnership with the uh, uh, National Environmental Management Authority of Kenya. Um, please come to the uh, stage. Um, we then have, uh, as you can see, it's a very gender balanced uh, uh, session. We have Emily Uwase from uh, Rwanda. With, uh, she's a climate finance analyst with the Rwanda Green Fund. Thanks for joining us. Um, we then have um, um, Tajiel Urio, the regional uh, senior lead uh, with the South Pole um, Corporation. Uh, we have Perumal Arumugam uh, with the UNFCCC Secretariat. He um, manages the uh, market and non-market mechanism uh, of the mitigation division of the UNFCCC. And of course, last but not least, uh, Jennifer Sara. Uh, she's the global director in the uh, climate change group with the World Bank. She also happened to be my boss, so welcome, Jennifer. And uh, so she uh, <laughs> she will uh, uh, provide uh, uh, she will provide some some opening remarks and moderate the uh, the session. So we have uh, about an hour. I think we're allowed to stay in this room for a little longer uh, than eleven, which is great because we have a very uh, kind of a rich set of uh, speakers. Um, and so without further ado, let me hand it over to uh, Jennifer for her opening remarks. Thank you. Okay. So how many of you were here at the, all week? You all been here all week since the summit? Great inspiration, okay. So yeah, so that was wonderful when President Ruto was saying, Jambo, and then with his Jambo, and then you say Mambo, and then who remembers what you say? Wow, right. <laughs> so I, I thought that I just wanted to remember this has been a long, long week. Uh, hopefully an inspirational week. For me, it's been incredibly inspirational. Um, the people in the room now, I was always saying that, I said that yesterday, you know, the VIPs have really done a wonderful summit, made lots of commitments, but the VVIPs are here because the people left are actually the people on the ground out there doing things. And so it's great and so wonderful to have everyone to the end and really delighted to join the second part of this session um, on unlocking the, the whole issue of you know, energy transition. Um, and now really let's zoom down and unlock the potential of carbon markets to support the net transition. Um, the first part was really just looking at the whole overall question of financing the energy transition. And we've heard all week, we're hearing more and more, Africa wants to be part of the carbon markets. Everyone else wants to be part of the carbon markets. And how do we make sure that Africa in its real um, role of leadership now on the global uh, climate agenda, actually also leads on setting the carbon markets and the rules of carbon markets in Africa for the benefit of Africa, so that it also generates uh, the revenue, the fairest share of revenue, um, helps achieve your mitigation objectives, um, and a transfer of funding, an equitable transfer of funding. So I think that's what we're really trying to do um, following up on the Nairobi Declaration is to put all this, this into action. And that's what we're trying to do um, in the session. So I won't go through all the numbers I have at the initial of the talking point, because we just talked about the huge financing gap, the huge financing needs. Um, and that's what you're just teasing out right now. How do you actually crowd in the different uh, forms of funding? But let's zoom straight into the carbon markets um, and how we can use carbon markets more effectively to raise the revenue. Um, for climate and energy transition, for energy transition projects. That's what we're gonna focus on right now. Um, we also know that in parallel to this, it's a mess, right? I mean, we're all working, Article 6 is out there, and I don't mean, it's true, we're working, the global community is working on it with the UNFCCC. How do we really uh, uh, fix the Article 6 or, or define Article 6 in, in the compliance markets? And meanwhile, we have this plethora of voluntary carbon markets and so how do we navigate all of this together? 
And of course, according to IETA, the value of the compliance market, the Article 6 market, could rise to $300 billion per year in 2030. These are IETA numbers. And to $1 trillion per year by 2050. Um, so those, that's a huge amount of money. Um, and then we're seeing uh, that the corporate demand is now starting to drive the voluntary carbon market to grow to nearly $2 billion. So that's a quadruple from 2020 to 2021, a, four, four, a four-fold increase. It's only $2 billion. So you say that there's a potential of $300 billion and we're at $2 billion in voluntary. So huge opportunity, um, which I think is exciting. From the World Bank side, we're working on three um, dimensions of the carbon market on supporting many, many partners on teasing out the global architecture, the level playing field, having clear standards, MRVs, uh, the carbon warehouse, uh, different ways of, 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 um, of having, really it is the way of transparency. I think that's what it is. The second one, which is really important, um, is on the supply side. And I think that's what we're gonna also really look at today. And we've been working for over 20 years on what we call results-based climate finance. Now, a lot of this has much been more in the forestry uh, sector, the Reg Pluses, the FCPF, which have made huge, huge progress and very, very exciting um, how you can actually create mechanisms where you can have carbon markets um, rewarding the conservation of forests and pass through mechanisms that actually go back to those who are actually sustaining the forests, um, the communities, the indigenous groups um, within a framework, a jurisdictional framework of government. Um, it's much harder on the renewable energy side, and that's what we're really trying to work on. Um, and so how do you build on that, the real space climate finance, and how do you then move that into something that's, that's really our credits and the sharing of credits? So, and then of course, a third part of it is the demand side. And there we're seeing lots and lots of interest and lots of announcements at the beginning of the week. ETA, uh, UAE putting, uh, announcing $450 million. So there's a lot of money, it seems, out there. How do we make sure the money in, there's a good deals going on is what we're really trying to do. So let me uh, not spend too much more time in introductory remarks. Um, we're really delighted, um, Emma, that you're here with us, so thank you. Um, you're the Energy Investment Policy Analyst at the International Energy Agency, and she's gonna give um, a really good framing, which is a, a presentation of the recent IEA report called Finance and Clean Energy in Africa. And that will help us then organize the discussion with the rest of the panel. So over to you, Emma, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, and I hope you don't mind if I do the presentation from here. I think we have some slides, um, if we can get those up. So, um, as mentioned, I'll provide some analysis from a report that we published, oh, thank you, um, that we uh, launched this week um, in collaboration with the African Development Bank, Finance and Clean Energy in Africa. And if you'll humor me, I'll quickly just start with a little bit of context um, in terms of the scale of the investment need. Um, so, according to our scenarios, in order for um, Africa to achieve their goals of um, universal energy access um, and uh, achieving their uh, NDCs in full and on time, um, energy investment needs to double from the level that it's at today uh, to 2030. And obviously, most of that growth comes from clean energy sectors. Um, so, you can see fossil fuel spending does still exist within 20, in 2030. Um, but you see a tripling of investment in renewables, a tripling of investment in grids, a rise in efficiency spending, as was discussed in the previous panel, the importance of um, efficiency alongside um, some of these you know, grids and renewable power projects. Um, and importantly, obviously, a significant increase in the amount of spending um, on energy access projects. So from the level today, we see uh, less than 5 billion US dollars invested in energy access. Um, but by 2030, this needs to increase to about $25 billion uh, per year. Now, obviously, this is a very ambitious uh, growth um, trajectory that needs, needs to occur. Um, and in order to achieve that, we also need to see a scaling up of multiple different sources of finance. And again, this was really discussed um, in, in the first session. Um, today, we can see that public spending, and here we're, we're referring to spending from governments, DFIs, and donors, um, that slightly outpaces spending from uh, the private sector. But by 2030, we do see a switch uh, in that. Um, balance. So we see the private sector spending increasing sixfold um, uh, to about 90 billion uh, US dollars per year, which is equivalent to total energy investment uh, in Africa today. Um, and how 
how do we see this occurring is obviously then a, a very important question. Um, and there are really a, a variety of ways. I think the first thing is uh, around policy reforms uh, and strengthening institutional capacity. A uh, second point on concessional finance, again, obviously uh, the, the focus of the first panel here. According to the IEA analysis, we found uh, that in order to achieve the, the 90 billion in private finance that's necessary uh, in 2030, you need roughly 28 billion in concessional funds directly targeted on mobilizing that private capital. Um, also, we see obviously a, a need to deepen local capital markets and, and financial systems. And then finally, the introduction of new financing mechanisms. Uh, these include things like green bonds, um, project aggregation platforms, and obviously carbon markets. Um, so focusing on the role of carbon markets, we're all aware that there has been some, or that there is still some controversy and some discussion around uh, the role that carbon markets can play. Um, but we find that they can provide um, a very unique and robust and reliable um, form to channel finance to emerging markets uh, and developing economies. Getting into the findings of the report specifically on the role that carbon markets have played uh, to date, if we start out by looking at the experience uh, within the CDM, we can see that CDM credits um, were very uneven uh, issuance, um, a very uneven issuance, sorry, um, among economies. So indeed, most African countries were not able to take full advantage of the CDM uh, compared to other emerging market and developing economies. Um, we love numbers at the IEA, so I'm going to just throw a couple of numbers at you uh, in relation to that. So all of the uh, 54 African countries uh, accounted for only 3% of CDM credits. Um, four countries, so Egypt, South Africa, Uganda, and Kenya, accounted for 83% of those credits issued. Um, and one single uh, nitrous oxide destruction project in Egypt alone accounted for 30%, so nearly a third of all of the CDM credits issued in Africa across the period. That imbalance is also reflected uh, within uh, the voluntary carbon markets. So only 11% of all credits used uh, in VCMs between 2016 and 2021 were issued in African countries. Um, VCM projects, again, were heavily concentrated, this time in, in five countries, uh, Kenya, Zimbabwe, DRC, Ethiopia, uh, and Uganda. So these five countries uh, accounted for around about 65% uh, of credits issued over the past five years. Um, and moreover, 85% of all of the African VCM uh, credits issued between 1996 and 2023 were from two types of projects, uh, forestry uh, and cookstoves. So it's clear that we need to increase uh, the opportunities to uh, use VCMs for renewables and industry uh, and other areas. Now, there are several reasons why um, African countries have not been able to fully benefit from carbon markets. Um, one of the reasons is that some African countries have been comparatively slow um, compared to other emerging markets and developing economies to establish the necessary uh, institutional and governance uh, frameworks for CDM or, or VCM uh, participation, uh, as well as promoting the use of these credits uh, to domestic actors. Um, in addition, uh, international CDM rules um, have not always been sufficiently compatible uh, with African GHG emission uh, profiles and mitigation opportunities. Um, and by that, I mean that African countries uh, that had low emissions um, meant that there was little emission reduction opportunities according to uh, the accrediting methodologies. Additionally, um, African countries have also had uh, difficulties with private sector engagement. Uh, so mostly this has been fueled by uncertainties uh, over in the investment environment, uh, as well as the ability to, to access projects. Um, and in certain cases, we've also seen that uh, crediting schemes in African countries have relied on imported technologies, which can increase the, the costs of the associated projects. So finally, looking forward, um, let me see if I can switch to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, so looking forward, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement presents a, a new opportunity for African countries to better and more evenly engage uh, in carbon markets. We've seen already uh, 42 countries have expressed an interest um, or an intention of engaging under Article 6 in their latest NDC submissions, uh, with the majority obviously seeing themselves uh, as a seller of credits. And the IEA have assessed the potential of these markets um, and, and showed that the implementation of Article 6 
could deliver financial flows that exceed 20% of required clean energy investment by 2030, uh, and that rises to 30% by 2050. And obviously, the financial flows from Article 6 um, markets would apply across all sectors, um, but they could nonetheless be very important um, as an investment source uh, for, for the energy sector. Firstly, they can help um, tip projects uh, into bankable propositions, uh, and secondly, they can also raise government revenue to reinvest uh, in the sector. So it's very clear that there are opportunities, particularly within Article 6 and the VCM, uh, to learn from the lessons of the past uh, and design markets that do facilitate a more inclusive and, and even engagement. Um, and in our view, uh, just to end, I think there are, are two aspects that we can really focus on here. Firstly, on Article 6 rules to make sure that these are um, fair and enable participation uh, across countries that intend to uh, voluntarily uh, cooperate. Uh, this should also include a capacity building element to make sure that government officials um, are fully understand the opportunities as well as the liabilities uh, associated with this participation. Uh, and then secondly, um, at the national level um, in, in African countries, to create the enabling conditions to access both the Article 6.2 and, and 6.4 opportunities. And there are lots of different elements to that, but essentially that means African countries uh, should be able to develop a, a national strategy uh, to, to access uh, Article 6. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. I'll, I'll leave it there and, and pass back to Jennifer for a discussion with the panel. Thank you so much, Emma. So um, I want to invite Garrett Phillips to come up to the stage, please. Um, we'll find another chair. You might have to come with a chair. Uh, take my chair. Um, OK, sorry. Um, all one big family, right? So Garrett's a very good colleague at the African Development Bank. You want to come here? So we work very closely together across the multilateral development banks in this group called the Climate Heads. And so that's really nice. It's a really nice way for us to, to, to collaborate and share experience. So, so welcome, and I'm glad you could join us. As you can see, we have, I'm really delighted, we have a huge panel, which is great. Uh, very, very much appreciate um, that. But we also want to be able to save time so that we can have questions from the audience. So what I'm proposing is that we plan to have two questions from each panelist. But if that's OK with you, what I do is just ask you um, just um, each one question, a combined question, um, and then we'll open it up to the audience um, for the second round. So we'll put the two questions together, and I think you've, you've received the questions beforehand, and so I hope this doesn't come to, as a surprise. Is this okay with everyone? Are you all right with that? Because um, I really think it's important. We have a, a very, very interested audience, and, and the interaction is probably very, very interesting. Um, so I think what we really want to know with you is, is, is really to tell us what you think the opportunities are, right? We can go into the challenges and the opportunities and specific lessons um, that you have from the uh, specific experiences that, that, you are, that you have, that, that you're doing on the, the, um, on the carbon markets. So maybe if we could just go, let me find the right order that we've agreed to. Um, sorry about that. So... Um, you threw me off here, Garrett. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It's, it's all a problem. Um, so we're, what we're proposing is, is we can um, go with Ms. Uwase Emily, who's the climate finance analyst at the Rwanda Green Fund. And then we would follow, um, if that's OK, with um, Nyatichi Omamya. Is that the, so, so that would be the person after that who um, would give us then uh, the experience from the Deputy Director of Program Partnerships for the National Environment Management Authority from Kenya. So we'll have the Kenya experience after that. Um, and then we will go to Tajil Rio um, so that we can also have the Article 6 vision from South Pole. Garrett, you'll be next. We have um, the multilateral development, the African Development Bank uh, uh, perspective. Um, and then we will go to uh, Peruma Aru Mugan. Uh, from the UNFCCC, so wonderful to have you there. So I think that covers everyone. And so over to you, Ms. Uwase, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm Emily from the Rwanda Green Fund, and we're a fund reporting uh, under the Ministry of Environment in Rwanda. So I want to talk a bit about the role of carbon markets in financing the energy transition in Rwanda. Uh, I want to tackle this question in two parts. First of all, in Rwanda, we believe that 
anything has to be the responsibility of the Rwandan government first. So I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing domestically, uh, our domestic reforms, and how we're preparing um, for the to access the carbon market. So a little bit about the Article 6 regulatory framework that we're putting in place with the UNDP. All right, so for the um, domestic reforms. So we, Rwanda, we believe that carbon markets can finance the energy transition if and only if the economic incentives are high enough um, for us. And so far, it has not been the case, but I'm just going to give uh, a few examples. So Rwanda is a small landlocked country in East Africa, and we have no energy and no minerals. So that's, for, that's our challenge to begin with. So we've put some domestic incentives and strategies in place. The main two are, is the, the first is the 2015 energy policy that introduced, introduced regulations, economic incentive, taxes, subsidies for installation of solar panels, solar, solar water heaters, and etc. And in this 2015 um, energy policy, uh, business are now undertaking an ener energy efficiency audit. So the second um, strategy was the biomass energy strategy, which goes until 2030. So this biomass energy strategy promotes um, efficient cooking stove and the phasing out of charcoal, which uh, about 83% of the population um, uses. And then, this, of course, this biomass uh, uh, has great mitigation effects as charcoal accounts for about 12% of greenhouse gas emissions in Rwanda. So this is really how we feel like we can engage the private sector genuinely first before we go on to, you know, the craziness of carbon markets. And, you know, from at least from the ministry, we believe that we should start by these reforms first. So now over to the carbon markets. So we think carbon markets is just one of the many financing um, sources, to be honest. You know, it's not the end all be all. Um, actually, Gareth and I sit at the CIF committee meeting, so we were always having these conversations. And in our, in our sector of uh, resource mobilization, um, nothing really comes easy. Even when we sit at the, the CIF committees, you know, and they have this call for proposals for countries like Rwanda. So, so maybe a little bit of, a, of an example is that, you know, the, the Climate Investment Fund puts this call for proposal. And then we, of course, we put, our, uh, we put out an, an interest. When we get it, they said, okay, um, now we can have a scoping mission, see what the country is all doing. And then we do that, and then they said, okay, we'll have an aid memoir to like uh, summarize everything that happened. We're like, okay, and then they have a joint mission with the MDBs, and then sometimes the MDBs get into it on who takes the lead on what. We're like, okay, and then up until the investment plan. So that's, that, that whole thing can take up to two years. So even, even with that, even with, uh, you know, SIP and the great programmatic approach, there's always um, so many uh, hurdles that we have to jump through. So it's no different with the carbon market, really. It's just a lot of, of hoops and hurdles. I'll give um, a few of these hurdles. Number one is lack of capacity uh, at the Ministry of Environment. Again, in measuring, in data, in verification, there's just not people able to do that. Um, number two, uh, the carbon markets are not really fair and efficient. I think this is not news. We've talked to, you know, how come it's higher valued when it's in Europe and not in Africa. So even that sentiment of like, okay, is this kind of a scam or we, what's going on is, you know, that, that feeling is um, also there. So if it's, if it really changes and if it becomes fair and efficient, you know, it can really, we believe it can really facilitate capital formation and drive values for investors and the private sector. But that's only if, if it's fair, of course. Um, so, so, so far, uh, yes, it hasn't really been attractive enough uh, for projects. Um, again, these are small scale, a small scale project, so we, it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of investment to put for, for not so much um, return. And then I'm just gonna finish about Rwanda, the work Rwanda is doing with the, with the UNDP to develop the Rwanda Article 6 regulatory framework. And then the main, the, uh, point of having this uh, regulatory framework is three things. 
Number one, to facilitate participation, of course, in the carbon markets. Number two, to bring confidence um, to the markets. And number three, to reduce the uncertainty of, of projects, especially for the private sector. So this is a little bit about Rwanda's experience. And, uh, you know, we, we still have to remember that these um, uh, new carbon offsets, uh, you know, it's such a small incentive. And we have to remember if we want to keep the 1.5 degrees goal alive, the, we believe the best solution is to just not pollute, not to trade back and forth. Thank you so much. All right, Emily, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Very comprehensive. Um, excellent experience from Rwanda. I love this, you know, the craziness of the carbon markets, the craziness of SIF. So um, I'm hearing that loud and clear, and that's maybe something we can fix with, with the next phase of the governance review. But this is really good, sharing that experience. But I'm really, it's nice to see a countrywide approach, the regulatory framework, the real lessons, and the dose of reality, real reality, that carbon's markets is part of the equation, but obviously it's a much bigger one. So let's go, let's go from um, Rwanda to Kenya. Um, and let's hear the Kenya experience from um, Yatichi. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Madam Facilitator and uh, um, distinguished delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I hope you are enjoying your stay here in Kenya and welcome once more again and again uh, to beautiful Kenya. Um, I'm from the National Environment Management Authority, which within the climate change space serves uh, four major roles. Uh, um, in this discussion, we are the designated national authority for the clean development mechanism, which is phasing out. We are also the national implementing entity for the adaptation fund, and we have just concluded implementing one of our programs, and then we are also the accredited entity for the Green Climate Fund. And domestically, we are also the supervisor, or could say monitor, the greenhouse gas emissions and the climate action within the country as per the Climate Change Act. So as an environment regulator, we have a huge mandate. And more specifically on the carbon markets, uh, Kenya um, was among the first African countries to have uh, the first CDM project, which was within the energy sector, converting by gas to electricity uh, way back in 2009. And since then, Kenya's portfolio grew having a total of 210 uh, program of activities, uh, uh, carbon projects within the country, cutting across uh, the clean development mechanism and the voluntary market mechanism. And just like uh, some other countries as presented by IEA here, we are heavy on energy generation uh, with our energy generator, Ken, uh, Kenya Electricity Generating Company, having the largest portfolio in terms of uh, energy generation. Uh, our second set of projects also come from uh, cook stoves, which has been mentioned in this report, and water purification. Within the voluntary market space, uh, we are participating uh, in the forestry sector, and this has brought about uh, quite a number of significant emission reductions. So just to say that Kenya over the years has traded over 12.1 million uh, uh, metric tons of CERs, also from the voluntary carbon markets, and we are also participating in the Red Plus mechanism, in the Japan Joint Carbon Credit mechanism. We have a standard approved, and I'm seeing Gareth here, on the adaptation benefit mechanism. We are participating within the carbon um, of, uh, uh, offset reduction within the aviation sector, and again, also in the clean development mechanism. So essentially, Kenya was among the early movers, and I think that's a principal lesson we learned from this is that the early bird catches the worm in the carbon market space. You have to grab the opportunities as soon as possible. And so what is the country doing? We are in a readiness process to prepare for the Article 6 mechanisms. Our president, His Excellency, Dr. William Samoy Ruto, did announce here that, and also launched our revised Climate Change Act, which provides for the carbon markets participation, both um, the regulated and voluntary market mechanisms. And so we are putting in place the legislative mechanism. We are going to soon have the carbon markets regulations, which will spell out how the trading happens, including issues of benefit sharing, which are critical to communities, which have arisen from our experience in the previous phase of the carbon markets. Further, we are putting institutional readiness processes to have all the necessary um, infrastructure for reporting, as, as you can know, and I know 
I'm sure Perumar is going to tell us here. We've just come from four days intensive training as these great national authorities on the requirements for the Article 6. They're quite intense on the host country governments, and that require a lot of resources in terms of the transition. Some of our projects are eligible for transition, and those who require also to apply for to transi transition if they wish. And um, uh, legislatively, Kenya is generally a green country in terms of energy generation. Our president has reiterated here in uh, various speaking forums that we are over 90% uh, gener energy generation in terms of uh, being green. green. And we target to reach 100% by 2030. That will require a lot. And as the previous panel spoke here, that will be a sustainable development transition. And our constitution provides for that. We have an Environment uh, Act, which already gives that provision. Further, our Energy Act, our Forestry Act, all keen, especially the Forestry Act, on biomass generation. On the user side, we're having a lot of experience in terms of growth in uh, uptake of, um, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I have a flu, but uh, I'm getting there. Uh, in terms of um, uptake of renewable clean cooking solutions, institutionals, especially because as you realize, quite a number of our institutions, uh, the learning institutions and uh, tertiary institutions, are they use a lot of wood fuel, biomass for cooking. And transition in that in terms of uptake of uh, energy efficient cook stoves is quite uh, good. And there are quite a number of technologies which are being showcased here at our, 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 our Expo Center. Further, we also have the Clean Cooking Initiative with the private sector and uh, non-sector actors through the associations and these are doing a good campaign, including uh, His Excellency the First Lady who's championing that front. So as a country, we are ready to take part in the carbon markets. Of course, the challenges are many to overcome by, uh, based on the experience that we have learned. But that is one of the basket of solutions that we have decided as a nation to take in form of addressing our low carbon climate resilience pathway. Why? It's because uh, they have both opportunities, even though carbon markets is often seen as mitigation centric. Within our country, the sectors in which we have gone to, into the energy transition, um, the agriculture, forestry, and land use investments, all those have a resilience building pathway, which are key in our aspirations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> that was actually really wonderful to hear everything that Kenya is doing and being such a front mover. And I think you, you reinforced what Emma had presented that a lot of what you've done so far is forestry or plus, and that's really been where, where you've been able, you have all the credits, um, but also getting ready for the next step. And I think Kenya represents a really interesting um, challenge in the sense that you've already so green, right? You have so much green energy, so how do you then measure the delta? And I know that's, that's one thing that everyone's working on, you know? If you already have um, a very good uh, low emissions trajectory, how do you actually then benefit from, from carbon markets as well? You know, it's not fair to be penalized um, that you can't benefit against a neighbor who has, you know, changing from a very um, a heavy thermal energy. So I think that's a really interesting um, question for Kenya. So let's stick to the close region here and let's go to Tanzania. Let's hear from a project developer, South Pole. Your experience in project developer, the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, what more can Tanzania do to help project developers um, uh, do more more work. So, Tajel, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. So, uh, I'm from South Pole, uh, and at South Pole, we have uh, actually uh, 17 years of experience in carbon markets, and we do work on uh, sustainable technology, uh, nature-based solution, but also we provide technical uh, services with regard to uh, carbon market regulation and, and, and frameworks. So, for Tanzania, uh, it's an interesting market for us. Uh, See, a year ago, they started to regulate a carbon market, and they come up with the regulation, which was, uh, I think, uh, it was really uh, formulated based on the Red Plus experience. And uh, though there, there are some exceptions uh, when it comes to non-land-based uh, projects, where the, the issues to do with uh, share of proceeds uh, can be negotiated. And I understand that now they are also reviewing the regulation to include issues to do uh, with the Article 6 uh, corresponding adjustment, all from the Article 6.2, uh, 6.4, and uh, 6.8 for, for capacity building. So uh, if you look at the uh, regional level, uh, taking the, the policy issues and policy direction in Tanzania, 
which didn't really do well on the CDM. Uh, there is a big shift uh, trying to capture the, the Article 6 market, but also the VCM market itself by having such a regulation which attract investment as per uh, as the way we look at it as South Pole. Uh, there are a number of challenges. Uh, I work at the African level uh, region. So uh, regional wise, there is a lot of challenge uh, to do with uh, the regulation and framework to, to regulate the market. So as a developer, it's really uh, attract us to go to the country that has a clear and stable regulation so that uh, it's a business reflective and for investment, it's good. Uh, with the, the opportunity under the Article 6, uh, which really require high quality uh, credit, you can say that, but also a high hang, uh, you, know, you know, technology, not really on the issues to do like uh, MBS. So this presents a big opportunity for African country, particularly on the investment to energy. And this will translate into uh, uh, consumers, particularly on the tariff. Um, but also this uh, will really encourage uh, investment because of the price. Under the Article 6, uh, particularly Article 6.2, with a cooperative agreement between countries, uh, the price is more stable. And this provides a guarantee that uh, when if you're developing, let's say, a renewable energy project, you are sure that uh, there's additional revenue that will come from the uh, carbon market, but also some others from the, uh, I mean, sales of the energy. So it presents this huge opportunity. But how to tap it? You need a good regulation in a given country that attract uh, this, uh, you know, kind of investment, but, but also it presents a market reflective carbon framework. So it's very important uh, because uh, there's a lot of things when it comes to uh, climate finance, carbon finance, and most of countries think that uh, the carbon finance itself can facilitate the implementation of their NDC. Uh, this is business as other business, so uh, it also needs to be a kind of balance. Yes, it needs to support the implementation of the NDC, but also it needs to look at the uh, that the investor that invest in the you know the finance. They need to recover the, the investment. So uh, it's an important to also to be able to account the benefit that goes to the community, not necessarily the financial benefit that goes to the central government. So uh, because. The way NDC are designed, um, it's, it's, it's cut across sectors. So the government, in, 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 in terms of uh, formulating these regulations, it should also account the contribution that goes directly to the community, and not necessarily the amount in terms of percentage, in terms of cash that goes to the central government accounts. At South Pole, we are working with a number of countries now with partnership with the UNDP. Uh, we're also looking forward to expand partnership with the UNEP to support countries. Uh, we, we work across the world, so we are supporting a number of countries in Africa, but also Asia and uh, Latin, to put in a place a framework that is uh, business reflective. It looks at the market, and it, we, because we understand the market, we have been in the market, we, we understand the trend and everything. So, to the point that if you get service from South Pole uh, re related to the framework and the relation and legislation related to markets, we, we, we are sure that uh, the business flow will come to your country because of the understanding. Of course, we don't dictate what to the final thing on the police because they have to be at the national level and it have to be owned by the country, but we give them the understanding of the market. So you make a decision which is informed is formed by data, informed by, by trend, but also with the technical and experience in the market. So uh, just to briefly, uh, the future of carbon markets is quite huge under Article 6. What is needed for Africa is also to explore bilateral relations, multilateral relations, so that we can, they can get this cooperative agreement between countries. Thank you. Um, so thank you. That, that was really a great um, presentation, bringing it back to Article 6.2 and the um, compliance market, you know, the, the higher standards, um, the but it does have higher advantages in terms of stability and continuity. And also, like you say, the importance of really work with government and developers and even communities to really understand the whole package there. And I really like at the very end, we, a lot of times we actually think the, the uh, compliance market is um, NDCs from, from the north, if that's the right thing. To the south, but you're saying south-south even exchanges within the region, which I think is, is fascinating. Okay, 
Garrett, over to you. Um, African Development Bank has done, been doing lots, and every speaker here has actually acknowledged the, the support that you've been providing them. So maybe what have, what, what's your approach? What have you been doing? What have you learned? And where are you going? Um, all in one. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, no problem. So I'm going to start actually with some uh, lessons. Uh, and Emma, thank you very much for your presentation. We picked up on quite a lot of the lessons we learned from, uh, from the CDM. But I had some more. And actually, interesting degree, because generally I'm an optimist at heart. My, my list of lessons is a lot longer than my list of opportunities. Oh, no. um, so, but I do have an interesting opportunity uh, at the end. So first of all, I want to highlight the um, risk uh, aversion um, that you see in the private sector. And I want to link that to the approval process that we see in Article 6.2 uh, in particular, and I expect in 6.4. Um, uh, when I worked in the private sector uh, um, in the CDM days, uh, I was quite taken aback by how ruthless uh, private sector investors were. And if you presented, because we had trouble in those days in getting the host country left for approval. And when you look now at the approval processes for Article 6.2, going forward through you know 10 or 15 stages, uh, cross-ministerial committee meetings, uh, and so on, and all of this with either the risk of removal or, or, or cancellation of the authorization and uh, uh, maybe a stop date at the end of the NDC period with uncertainty about whether that's going to be renewed. That will be a major barrier for private sector investment into projects uh, because, you know, put that into practical terms, it's maybe going to take you two or three years to get your project up and running. That could be 2027 before you're actually generating any credits. Uh, and then the NDC period comes to an end in 2030. And is it going to be renewed or not? We don't know. So that, I think that's a major issue that needs uh, to be taken into consideration. Um, the impact of commoditization uh, of, uh, of credits, um, this was what really drove the, uh, the, the carbon, the CDM markets, away from Africa and to China, India, and Brazil. Uh, and I know this because it, in the company I worked for at the time, our motto was to be the Saudi Arabia of the carbon world. We wanted to produce the stuff at $2 and sell it at 20 And, you know, that's rational private sector actor. Uh, doing that. And uh, if you put up any barriers or things are harder to do, then you scare away that investment. And it's very difficult uh, to take an instrument like the Article 6.2 uh, and, and all these great words about people saying, yeah, you know, we want to invest in good projects. But when it comes down to the line, it's money that's being paid. And the private sector uh, is very careful with where they spend their money. So, so that's a very big lesson that, that we learned. Um, Another challenge we had, uh, and I think this still persists, is uh, the time gap between developing your project and getting your revenues. And uh, of course, in the CDM, this led to the aggregator model, uh, where there were plenty of aggregators who would buy forward purchase uh, emission reductions from project developers at two, three dollars, and then aggregate them all up and sell them on at twenty, thirty dollars. Uh, but they would provide the finance for the project, uh, and. Uh, I, 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 I heard a statistic, and I didn't note down where I got it from, so I'm only sort of quoting it third hand. It was at the um, World Bank PMI conference we had in Rwanda, and there somebody said that something like 70 or 80 percent of African project developers only ever develop one carbon project because they don't make any money from it. They develop it, they have to forward sell their credits, they do their project, and that's it. Uh, the money is made somewhere else. So this uh, this kind of financing challenge is, and that's something that the African Development Bank could be in a position to step in to, to do that. I have sent a proposal up to my management to you know to see if we could take something like that forward. There's definitely a role to provide uh, project finance to help African project developers benefit from the sales price uh, of the emission reductions. Um, and the last, well, the next one I want to highlight is the distorted impact of non-CO2 uh, abatement projects. Um, because we saw in the CDM and, and in the slides from Emma how big the impact of some of those projects was. And we need to deal with that somehow. Uh, and I do have a suggestion uh, for that. Uh, but otherwise, we may see situations where there are some uh, abatement projects that are uh, highly profitable uh, and yield large numbers of emission reductions. And we need to find some way of, of sort of addressing those and trying to level the playing field. And then uh, there's a very important issue that arises as we transition from CDM to Article 6 in the Paris Agreement. In the CDM, governments were happy to sign letters of agreement or authorization because what they were giving away, the emission reduction units, were of no value to the host country. The CDM didn't require host countries to do anything. The Paris Agreement does. And in that process, it means that emissions and emission reductions are sovereign assets. And there has to be equity about who accesses and who has the right to sell these emission reductions. 
and how do citizens or taxpayers of the host country benefit from that? And if we don't have that transparency, and you know, some of these things turn up in a parliament somewhere, and somebody says, oh, do you know it's the president's brother-in-law who's selling those, then it's going to significantly damage the credibility of this instrument. So there must be equity and transparency in the processes that allow the, 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 the sale of these units to take place, and there has to be uh, benefits for the host country. So these are some of the, the lessons that I picked up from the CDM and that I'm aware of as we move uh, into Article 6. And now, uh, what's the opportunity? And uh, sorry, I have a completely different uh, solution to that. And it is Article 6.8. It is non-market approaches because so many of the challenges and the problems that we're seeing coming up with Article 6.2 and 6.4 are related to the market-based approach, the commoditization, the trading, the speculation in these units. If you adopt a non-market approach, then all of those issues go away. Uh, now, we have an instrument, and I, I won't go into it in detail here, it's called the Adaptation Benefits Mechanism, uh, and it's an extremely interesting, the more I've worked on it, the more I've learned about the potential benefits of moving away from a market-based approach and creating non-fungible, we call them certified adaptation benefits, which we propose that uh, uh, governments, corporates, and consumers purchase and surrender and report in the transparency framework as evidence of their contribution towards stated adaptation needs in developing countries. Now, there's no reason why you couldn't do that for mitigation. And there is perhaps a specific window to do that for non-CO2 mitigation projects so that you take the non-CO2 out of the carbon market and deal with them through a non-market-based approach. And it's effectively a marginal financing process. It's you, the process is you say, how much money do you need to make this project work? And then you provide that amount of money. And it's not that the, 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 the units or the, the certificates that come out of it aren't tradable and they don't go into that speculative model. So lots of interesting stuff there to talk about. Uh, and you can see more about the adaptation benefit mechanism at abmechanism.org. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to talk about it more. Thank you very much. Well, that was really fantastic and, and really appreciate you got a lot in. Um, I'm trying to catch up in the short amount of time, but this is really great. I mean, you obviously had such a great experience coming from the private sector um, into the, the African Development Bank, working with countries, and time and time again, you say leveling the playing field. And I think that's really, really important. And that comes back to the rules of the game, uh, of the, um, the rules of the game, and this whole challenge of the so sovereign assets. And we're seeing this now about governments wanting to tax them, who owns the, you know, you're cleaning the air, you're taking carbon, you're preventing carbon going to the air, or you're removing carbon from the air. Um, Private sector people are doing it, communities are doing it, uh, but they're uh, assets that the sovereign owns. So I think that really is a good segue to you, Trumal. I mean, it really is. The pressure's on at UNFCCC, and everyone's saying, why is it taking so long? And I think we've heard why it's taking so long, but you know, wonderful work that you're doing there. Um, and maybe if you can tell us um, some key takeaways, where are you at in the UNFCCC on the Article 6? You know, what's the next step? What are the rule books for Africa? Um, you know, the lessons, building all these lessons here, but then, you know, what, how you take this forward. So wonderful, over to you to solve everything. <laughs> I'm here to solve everything, thank you. Uh, no, um, if you listen to from the beginning from uh, Jennifer, I think uh, uh, I think all the VIPs have gone, we are all the VVIPs. So within the panel, if I'm speaking the last, so then I'm the most VVIP person on the panel. <laughs> Um, so no, I think like uh, the, the potential for carbon markets, uh, I think Jennifer has covered, um, I think Emma has covered, so I will not bore you with that. Uh, since um, Jennifer broke the secret of uh, questions being shared in advance, so that was one of my questions. So I'm not going to bore you with that on how the global landscape of carbon market is. Uh, but Gareth, uh, I would say that um, um, it's not as gloomy as how you started. Actually, you made it very rosy in the end saying that you are going to talk about challenges rather than opportunities. I agree with you, Emily, that uh, carbon markets are not a silver bullet solution for climate change problem. Uh, let's, uh, let's face that. And I know that because of the uh, one element within the Paris Agreement, which has a direct relationship with the private sector, you hear a lot about carbon market, but that's just not the silver bullet solution. Maybe you might be wondering I'm, why I'm saying it, because my bread and uh, butter is earned out of carbon markets. But still, I'm saying this because I think for the global cause. Uh, and as from UNFCCC, I'm as e equally has to be inclusive. Um, so I think uh, I also agree that over a point of time, if we are all together committed what we have committed to Paris Agreement in 4.4, where uh, 
a particular paragraph where we all agreed that we will be moving towards an economy-wide NDC, the scope and the role of carbon markets will start diminishing and we will be going towards the non-market-based approaches, which may happen in the mid-century. But now what we are talking about is what we will do between now until that middle century, uh, where uh, if I see as a global carbon market landscape, I think it's where we will be ending up at some point in time in 6.8, if we are all collectively committed to what has been inscribed in Paris. Um, and we will be taking some amount of sectors, and that's where I will jump into the African context. Uh, so to all of you, I wanted to say eight key areas or key outcomes that could be used by Africa or where Africa could benefit, uh, which where we have talked about challenges earlier from all of our colleagues in the panel. The first and foremost in the rules that you asked, Jennifer, is the scale neutrality. Right. So currently, like we talked about cookstoves, we talked about jurisdictional way of REDS uh, projects. So Article 6 G comes with its rule of with full flexibility of scale agnostic. So you can imagine an activity at a facility level, community level, a sectoral level, a program level, or at a policy level. So there is no short of dearth of imagination of what your scale and size could be for you to do an activity in your country. If you're looking at large scale energy, transformation in a Southern African power pool and a Western African power pool, you have already started doing an economies of scale in terms of how this could then further be used, I think is one of the things that you could think of. So first, my thing was scale neutrality. Second is type agnostic. I would say that's again beneficial for African continent is the type agnostic in terms of both emission reduction types and removal types. <laughs> Right, so in, in the former KP world, we had uh, limitations on the types as well as on the scales, which you do not have in Article 6. So <laughs> always when there is a huge flexibility, the complexity comes behind it. So that's response to you that why we are taking more time uh, to produce the rules is because the uh, it's kind of an open book. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that um, the things that are done are contributing to reduction of emissions, not to increase of emissions. So that's the second opportunity, I would say, from the African region. Number three, I think in the previous panel, we heard from some of our colleague about the suppressed demand uh, concept. Uh, from Kenya, from Annie, we listened to, I have 90% of renewable energy uh, that is in the grid. So what is my future, right? So there are two concepts that are embedded within the Article 6 rules, which again benefits African continent, is one in terms of looking at uh, the future anthropogenic emissions, right? So you are not looking at historical emissions of what is currently happening, <laughs> but you are going to look at in my long term, in my short term, long term, mid term, this is my scenario. And this is how I'm going to pro move forward. And within that scenario, what is your baseline reference level, the delta that you are talking about? That I would see as the third element for African continent to look at in establishing baselines, which looks at not at historical level of emissions or current level of emissions, but look at the future anthropogenic emissions, taking into account your plans for your future expansion. Because we are all talking about, uh, I was in three days ago when the VIPs were discussing about energy transition, all the ministers with the COP presidents, uh, the incoming COP president designate, I clearly learned that only 1.29% of the energy investments happened on renewable energy came to sub-Saharan Africa. Right? So you know that transformation is happening, but it is not happening. Why? I will come to the last on where we could do that. So I think the future of anthropogenic emissions. The fourth one, I think, uh, is the flexibility in operationalization uh, in terms of reduction of transaction costs. Right? So there are three elements. Among the 50 African countries that we have, 50 plus African countries, we have 30 plus as least developed countries, if I'm not mistaken. Right, So the rules gives the flexibility on two counts. One, you do not have an obligation, since you do not have an NDC kind of an obligation, you have certain level of flexibility, number one. And then in the operational rules and modalities, we heard about transaction costs of under, under um, to make the delta and to make sure that your activity would not have happened, right? So the supervisory body that will be meeting next week in Singapore, which some of us from here in the room are going to travel to Singapore next week, is looking at a concept paper on one to have simplified additionality demonstration for LDC countries. So which means 
you may have if you are coming from an LDC African country, irrespective of your current level of penetration of your renewable, you may be tabled as additional activity, right? This is for LDC. I'm not covering all the 50, but at least the 30. The second operation, operationalization simplification is already there was a decision that for in order for to transact within the carbon, there is a transaction cost of 2% you have to provide as an administrative share of proceeds. You as an LDC countries are exempted from that fee in comparison to any other country, right? So that's second benefit in terms of operationalization, the simplification in terms of reduction of transaction cost. The third, uh, the fifth one, I think we, again, like, as I said, that the panel, like, although all it starts with gloomy, it becomes rosy for me because going back to Emma, uh, you provided the numbers of the disparity uh, and uh, Gareth and me could rub shoulders because we were in the same boat of making money in the private sector before. Um, it's quite clear where we are forgetting is that there was a key decision that has happened in Glasgow about transition of activities. And what I would love to see is that in the presentations to see the number of activities that were added from African region from 2013 to 2020, which was eligible to transition. So the fifth biggest point, because I still remember some of my friends are not here, they said, we African continent has caught up with the carbon market and we understood the rules in 2013 you guys changed the rules from soccer to uh, soccer to something else right don't forget the african continent is not start starting from scratch you have 350 assets that is being carried over to paris which no other single major emerging economy is having you as a continent so out of the eligible 670 to 730 projects 370 are coming from africa so you are not nobody else has that cushion as an african continent that you are not starting from a scratch when the new article 6 is getting operationalized africa is sitting with an existing asset of 350 activities to play around in the market and capitalize so that's the fifth benefit that i would say that the african continent is looking at in the article 6 and the sixth one i know that i need to <laughs> go far uh, i think like one in terms of uh, the benefit sharing, I think, which uh, already he has covered. And two uh, things that I wanted to also say that where we need to look at, um, although I have eight points, but I could see Jennifer wants to stop me, but I wanted to talk on two things, like uh, beyond whether it's an African region or any other region. My simple thing um, to say is like for any financial transaction to be sound, all of us will enter a swift code, right? So for carbon market to be that efficient and effective, the carbon market also has a SIFT code, which is supplementarity, integrity, transparency, and fungibility, right? If we can ensure that in the market, all in addition to the regulatory framework that our colleague from South Pole said, you need to have this, like in terms of all that you do has to be beyond what you could have done, that is the supplementarity, integrity in terms of MRV, baselines, et cetera, then the transparency element, which World Bank was talking about, climate data trust. We as UNFCCC is generating four international things that needs to be there as an infrastructure and the fungibility. Because I cannot have a unit that is coming from Tanzania and a unit coming from Rwanda from the same activity with similar socioeconomic condition having two different outcomes. So that we need to ensure as a carbon market, whether it's voluntary or in compliance. Last but not least, for African countries, for you to capitalize on, you would be using an infrastructure because I know that many countries here have been told that you need to have to develop your national registry to participate in Article 6. That's a myth. It's a fallacy. You do not need to participate in a mechanism. You need a national registry. You have tasked UNFCCC to establish international registry. You need to just open an account with minimum cost. That doesn't mean that you should not engage in establishing national registry. That is good for you to do. And the last, which I want to come back to Jennifer on the last one, primarily because to, yeah, so that's the last to say to uh, Jennifer is because always like we have been branded, like you get some branding, right? So when Jennifer was starting, she said Article 6 is a compliance tool. Let me clarify, Article 6 is not a compliance tool. Article 6 is both a compliance tool and a voluntary tool. The mitigation contribution units that are established in Sharm el-Sheikh 
as a definition under Article 6, is going to be a competition to voluntary markets and it will be at par with voluntary market. And then we will leave it to the market to decide whether they would go through an international mechanism that is established multilaterally, which can provide the voluntary services or another voluntary standard. So I wanted to clarify that myth because always people, the moment you say Article 6, it is labeled as a compliance mechanism. Don't forget it, it's a compliance and a voluntary mechanism. Thanks. So thank you very much, and I stand corrected in that, and fully, fully agree, you know, that, that that's what it is. It's really establishing the rules of the game, the architecture uh, across everything. I'm not gonna tr summarize everything that you said, and you know, the secret is not so much you give people questions, but usually when you have an answer, you get three messages, and then say, okay, fine, I combined two questions, okay, you can do six, and get eight. Um, so it's great, but it's, this is an amazing panel. Um, six people, we've been struggling all week, you know, panelists confirmed that they're going to come, and we. We're ready and we have four or five and then two show up and this is fantastic. It's such a wealth of experience. I wish we had a whole lot more time, but um, I think everyone can see what, what the opportunities are and maybe follow up afterwards, but I hope that people can stay until 11.30. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, so we have 15 minutes. What I would propose is love to hear the questions and if that's okay with the panelists, let's take maybe five questions. You're not gonna have to answer um, all the questions. Uh, we'll see how many there are. I'll do one round, uh, just in case there are that many questions, and then you can pick one, and then we'll, have a, and, and we'll see what the room wants to do. So if you want to ask a question, I'd really ask you to please go up to a microphone. Um, introduce yourself real quick, that's nice, and then it's behind you. The microphone's right there, there's two, one on each side. And then panelists, you know, pick, pick, um, pick and choose. Okay, thanks. Yes, Axel Michaelova from Perspectives. My question to you would be, how would you see the tendency of yeah, voluntary carbon market um, standard providers coming to African countries, offering the services as one-stop shop for Article 6.2? And um, do you, don't you see that this generates risks for the credibility and integrity of the international carbon markets under the Paris Agreement? Okay, thank you. Um, do we have more questions? Aha, uh -huh. so I thought that would be, so, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, good morning. My name is Florian from Atmosphere. I have one question regarding the different units under 6.4. We can generate two different units with authorization and corresponding adjustments in those without code now uh, MCUs. And uh, Ger Garrett, you touched upon your preferences about non-market solution for certain types of activities. How do you see the MCUs play into that? And to the countries, where do you see the potential uh, rather ITMO transfers uh, for a voluntary market or for compliance, or the potential of MCUs generating investments in your countries? Great, very clear questions. Um, anybody else have questions? Okay, so what I'm going to propose is we ask the panelists to answer those who want to the questions uh, that were just formulated, and then we're going to go back to the panelists, and I, I'm very happy to know that we have a few more minutes so that you can kind of interact and respond to everything you heard. Um, that would be really good to hear from you, what you heard from your colleagues on the table, and what your, your, your reactions are, and what you're gonna take away from it. So let's first answer these uh, three questions from two people. Um, do we want to, does anybody want to jump in? Uh, there's one on the standard service provider. I don't know if that was directed or not to anyone. Then um, there's the other one about the, uh, the, the different units and NCUs. Who wants to go first? Garrett, you get to go first. Go so let me start with the last question on the, um, sort of the MCUs. Um, so, I, I mean, yes, I think the, uh, the, these could be addressed as a, as a non-market instrument, but one of the benefits we see um, if you move to the non-market instrument and uh, the uh, generation of certificates rather than units, then it means you're creating, you're, you're sort of certifying and, and, and issuing information for reporting rather than units for compliance. And there's a big advantage here because the complexity of the verification certification process is much less. Um, when, you're in, when you're issuing information for reporting purposes, it's not to say that the accuracy is, isn't an issue, but 
uh, you know, you may find that there are purchasers who are happy to accept that they've got a monitoring program that gives them, you know, 90% uh, certainty, and they know, you know, they, 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 they paid for 100 hectares, it might have been 90 hectares or it might have been 110. It doesn't really matter because they're reporting their contribution. That doesn't fly in the carbon markets because a ton has to be a ton. It's used for offsetting. And so the, you know, one of the advantages of a non-market approach is that you can have much simpler monitoring verification processes. And we know from our experience of the clean development mechanism that those activities can become extremely complex and expensive. They're typically done by experts flying in, not by domestic resources and so on. And that just perpetuates the exclusion uh, of and capacity building in domestic markets. So, um, you know, we, you, I, I, you could use the MCUs under a non-market approach, but we think there might be easier and cheaper ways of delivering the same outputs uh, using a non-market approach. Thank you, Gareth. I will pick it up from there. Um, so the way I see is that uh, the mitigation contribution units uh, in a short term might be used by reduction type of activities and Article 6.8 ABM and other thing might be used by removal types of activities until we have clarity. Uh, much uh, elaborated rules are being done. Uh, I see that uh, for MCU. And then now, uh, since you're rubbing shoulders, like I can say the benefits of MCUs than what you would be doing. Like I think MCU, like uh, the standards, protocols, and all what he said might take increase the transaction cost, provides the necessary certainty and absoluteness if somebody is trying to, because the MCUs are mitigation contribution units, because you heard earlier from Gareth also about the host party's negative environmental debt, right? Like when you transfer one unit outside of your country, you have to account them as emissions, so which means that you are selling your national assets. So the MCU units are units which that the assets remains within your country where you are getting some kind of finance. So if I am a donor country and if I have to be recognized as part of my climate finance contribution under 9.5 of the Paris Agreement, for me, there is a clear channel that all what I have invested and claimed by saying that I have contributed this much amount for this much reduction is coming through a global system where the standards are done multilaterally, the transparency uh, process, contribution to adaptation, overall mitigation of global emissions, etc. Because despite those are two use categories, the quality of the units remains the same, whether it is for compliance or for um, mitigation contribution unit. So in that case, I think as a donor country or a donors might potentially prefer for MCUs, but until such time that the policy vacuum on the removal guidance are being elaborated and fleshed out, I see that a lot happening on the removal world under 6.8 and reduction things under 6.4. Uh, then going to Axel's question, like I, I think uh, there's always uh, a kind of a risk in that, uh, but I, I at least I'm privy to some of them being like observing the ICVCMI board or uh, working in the Corsia related elements as a working group member. Every Each of them have their own work program and work plan to look at the uh, compliance market rules that might come under Article 6.4 and how they align with. So as long as that they use the UNFCCC standards as a reference and do better than that, I don't see that it might have an integrity problem, but if they go to the rock bottom below something that has been collectively agreed by 196 country, that will uh, spoil the credibility of the carbon market more than what uh, we have seen. And in terms of transfer potential, I think in the last question, and I think depending on all the national climate legislations coming up saying 40% uh, remains to the state, 25% remains to the state, I see more and more of compliance market units being traded than voluntary over time because I think every single voluntary market will, uh, market operators may also requiring some kind of an host party endorsement and when that is there I think uh, more and more compliance units might only be going and the voluntary markets will still have the space for areas where technology improvement and other thing is needed and Jennifer if you give me half a second no, half a second because what I heard again from the, uh, the CPD minister, uh, consultation with the ministers is that the African continent has enough potential for the production of renewable energy. And all those sites are in locations where you do not have your necessary infrastructure to transmit them. Why not the voluntary carbon markets look at improving that infrastructure, leave the renewable energy generation to the compliance part? and the voluntary part work on improving and strengthening the distribution system to enable 
things, and that's that's clearly a VCU. That's improvement of moving from 11 kV line to a 33 kV line, etc., is never going to be considered as in in their NDC compliance. So I would say, com compared to that, I think that could be one VCM we can look at. Well, jurisdictional is important. What's public? What's private? Um, what's what carbon market to use? But you have to look um, also at regional power grids. So a good last point. Does anybody else want to answer any of the questions? Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. They don't want to answer those questions. Or, yeah, you do, I'm sorry. And then we'll come back to the final round of your takeaways. I, th I think for the, for the countries we were asked um, where we see the potential either between the voluntary or compliance markets, I think that will be sector-based, and I think very well has answered that. We have a huge potential as a country within the agriculture, forestry, and land use. And that, unfortunately, never quite benefited from the compliance sector. And so they have a huge opportunity within the voluntary, and that's where uh, that went. In terms of for us, because we're already over 90% green, that is on the generation side, we have a huge potential on the consumption side and transmission and their technologies in terms of improving efficiencies and uh, domestic use to, uh, to, uh, to enable um, clean energy use. There's a lot of potential there, and that can grow within the compliance and it depends on the developer which way they want to swing. Thank you very much. Perfect. That's great. Should we just go down the line and kind of your, your, your final takeaways? Emma, did you want to come in? You've been silent so far. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah well, as a final takeaway, I'll, I'll keep it very brief. But I think similar to Gareth, I have a, a world view that I always try and be a cautious optimist. So I think for me, it, the, the main takeaway is that we have this wealth of experience already on the yes. continent mm -hmm. from the government side, from the developer side. And so it's clear that there's this opportunity to learn. And so where we have the Article 6 markets that we're implementing, particularly where I sit, we're always looking at how to mobilize the private sector. And so if we can use the lessons that we already have to design systems that are efficient in attracting the private sector, and I think we heard some of those lessons here today, then I think that presents a really exciting opportunity for how to scale the market in a different manner to how we've seen historically. Thanks. Excellent. So should I just come down the, the panel this way, um, just your, your final takeaway? And this last chance for anyone to ask a question. I know we didn't answer all the questions, but you can come up afterwards if you want to follow up. Last chance for anyone in the audience. Could you please go to the microphone? And then we'll, I'm looking, we have five minutes. So then we'll have everyone who hasn't spoken the final takeaway. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Francis Makabwa. There's a, an issue, I think, uh, one of the presenters mentioned about uh, CDM countries were happy to sign, but under the Paris Agreement, uh, there's an element of sovereign assets, so people are not as keen. So can we just shed some light on it, just from my understanding? And then there was an issue about um, non-CO2 products. Can you just clarify or enhance understanding of what you mean by non-CO2 products in the perspective of climate change? Perfect. No, actually, this is all. Garrett, so Great. do um, that. And yep, you're thanks. Take it. So, the, I mean, the sovereign assets aspect is that... Um, I mean, there are sovereign liabilities, uh, but it's a liability that can be turned into an asset because you can reduce it. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's the government's responsibility to cope with uh, and deal with the greenhouse gas emissions and to report them under the uh, enhanced transparency framework and uh, uh, meet their NDCs. Um, so when you then, you know, if, if you take those uh, emission reductions and issue corresponding adjustments to allow somebody else to sell those out of the country, then you are prejudicing your your own level of ambition, your own compliance with your own targets, because you're you're giving away things that you need to meet your targets. Now, you may be able to negotiate, uh, and you may say, okay, I'll give them to you for five years, and then they they come into our national inventory, and so on. So there are ways around that, but there has to be transparency because that conversion from uh, a voluntary to a corresponding adjustment or to mitigation outcome with a corresponding adjustment brings significant value to whoever has the right to sell. And, and that's what I'm saying, that, that these are sovereign assets that are being sold. And we saw that a little bit in, in joint implementation uh, under the, uh, the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and we used to, to, to joke about it. It's probably not very funny, actually. But anyway, Putin used to have to sign the transfer agreements for uh, any joint Im uh, implementation, emission reduction units coming out of Russia. And we used to joke about it and say, well, I bet he didn't do that for free. And you know, so, so that was an example of, of you know, how those sovereign assets were being uh, offloaded uh, in non-transparent ways. And on the non-CO2, so this is things like methane and nitrous oxide. You saw the example from Emma uh, where there was one project in Egypt was the, the NOx abatement 
from a fertilizer plant, I think, uh, or a dipic acid that you know, that produces a huge amount of emission reductions for a relatively small investment. And it's hugely profitable for the, the developer who does that or the company. There were some quite uh, well-known stories uh, from the clean development mechanism days uh, of, of the, the um, amount of money that was made from some of those kinds of projects. And it tends to upset the playing field and it makes it very difficult to compete when you're just looking at sort of plain vanilla renewable energy projects when you've got these non-CO2 abatement projects coming in with much higher values. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, and I mean, the wealth, the depth of experience here is, is, is tremendous. And so I'm sure there'll be a lot of conversations afterwards. Um, Tajil probably, he, he said 30 seconds. Uh, no, not Tajil first, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll go to Paramal, then we'll go to Tajil. And Emily, yeah, really? we started, we're gonna come to you last. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah, oh, wait, wait. Garrett said he wants to follow her, too. You want to do it? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, okay go, we, let's just go down the line, okay? From here? So that way, start you start down right, there. Okay, so, so I've got two things. First of all, sorry, but corporates and governments need to reduce. Offsetting is not the solution. You have to keep the pressure on them to reduce. Uh, that's the first thing. And adaptation is the elephant in the room. The costs of adaptation are very soon going to become greatly more than the cost of mitigation. And if we don't pay attention to that, then there's going to be an awful lot of people losing their livelihoods, uh, being marginalized, and ultimately migrating. OK. That was um, really two excellent points. Thank you. The topic is on uh, energy transition um, and the global carbon markets, uh, if not in Africa, 60% of the volume has a template. It has both pros and cons, goods and bads, for the African group, African continent to learn from. The carbon markets, uh, in terms of number of activities, it's all renewable energy, which has benefited. Look at the template of both pros and cons of what has happened from a country which moved from 20,000 megawatts to 190, 169 gigawatts in 15 years, and what contribution that the carbon market has done. And uh, as I said, African continent is not starting from the scratch in terms of Article 6. So you have both the topic that you are looking at, energy transition, and you are not starting it uh, from the scratch. So Africa has a huge uh, leverage to capitalize on these carbon markets. Excellent. Great. Sergio? Uh, Salzburg is one of the leading uh, best uh, energy uh, carbon project developer. And Africa has potential also to be part of this uh, energy transition by having uh, a good framework in place that can attract this kind of investment. But for one thing that uh, every investor needs, it's a stable and, and consistent business environment that uh, can attract this uh, long-term investment. So we can really realize energy transition and carbon market has a good potential to finance this transition among other sources, but it can only be done if things are good in respective country. Hey, Emily. Thank you, Jennifer. So I started with Rana's example, and i also closing, so I guess I'm the real VVIP today. <laughs> um, so no, but um, thank you. So everything from our, our colleague from UNFCCC said, all eight points were really well noted and very encouraging to hear, and especially reducing the entry cost for the least developed countries. But again, I want to echo what Gary said, offsetting is not, is, is kind of just a distraction. We need to put pressure on our countries, especially the global north, to keep the 1.5 degrees alive. Thank you. Fantastic. And you know, it's hard to add the final word. But before I, I do the couple of uh, concluding remarks, I really want to thank everyone who's gotten us here today. It's been a lot of work. Thank you, all the organizers, some of you sitting here in the front row. Thank you very, very much. Um, and a huge thank you to the panelists. And you know, it's risky to put six people on a panel and we all start speaking really, really quickly. The passion, the knowledge on the subject is great. And again, we're just going to continue and hopefully we, you know, it becomes a big community that we continue to work together. Um, I'm not going to have a lot of, of takeaways. I mean, COP26 was really a fundamental game changer, a major, major milestone with the Article 6 rulebook. And that's great. And that's, um, you know, that's not very long ago. But then we hear what's happened and what's happening and what people want. And so I think it's really exciting because how do we move forward? It's not about you know how do we build capacity for Africa, but how do we actually learn and take these lessons? I think, Emma, that's what you had said, really bring that all in and that Africa sits at the table also as we shape the next stages of, of the rule book, you know, the 2030, the 2050. It's scary, 
we haven't fully figured out 2030, we'll jump to 2050, um, and it's important to have that, the, the medium term and the long term view. I really, a couple things really important about the benefit sharing we talked about, the forward looking baselines that the, the lower income in con countries don't be left out. They have no emissions, very little emissions so far, but you know, it's not fair then to be penalized for that. Um, I think the important thing is also, as, as, as Emily said, several of you said, it's not about just transferring resources, outsourcing my NDC or my compliance to someone else because um, my commitment, because it's cheaper for them to do it. Um, I think that's important. It's about uh, reducing emissions, right? That's what this is all about. And finally, 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 the last word, we need to talk about a carbon price. You get a carbon price, you have a global price. I mean, that. can you just imagine how all of our lives would be so much easier? Um, but let me end with that. Thank everyone again and um, look forward to continued conversations on this. Coitado povo, coitado povo. Oh, África, oh, tabanca, oh, povo. Coitado.